Welcome to the Mystery Mouse Knitting Podcast. My name is Holly and I'm coming to you today from Colorado where I live with my husband and our five kids and our many pets. And today is uh, Friday, March 17th. Um, so thank you for joining me today. Um, this is a podcast mostly about knitting and uh, some other craft stuff and books. So um, I am so excited to be uh, recording today. I have so much to talk to you about again. Not quite as much knitting, although I have done a ton of knitting, I feel like, but um, not quite so many different projects. So um, first of all, my mug of the day, I got a new Beauty and the Beast mug. This is from uh, Second and Charles. It's uh, the out of print um, range, I think. I have this as a tote bag, so when I saw that they had a mug of it, I had to get it. I'm drinking coffee today. Um, it's the afternoon, so I always crash in the afternoon. Teddy tells me it's because I drink coffee too soon after I wake up and I should wait until I've been up for 90 minutes. <laughs> I can't do that. I don't know how people wake up without coffee, so. But anyway, um, I actually made notes. I'm so responsible. It's just unbelievable. Uh, so I don't have any finished objects this week, but I do have something that's almost finished. So in my works in progress, I am working, it's, it's such a mess. I'm working on in this, uh, this is an Easter basket that I bought last year. Well, it was in the Easter baskets. It's just a fabric basket with rainbows on it. I thought it was perfect for this. I actually gave it to Ivy for her birthday and uh, asked her if I could borrow it for her sweater. So this is Ivy's rainbow, uh, neon rainbow sweater. I am almost done. I uh, am on the ribbing and I wanted to get it, uh, get the bottom bound off and everything, but uh, it was just like, I couldn't, I couldn't keep putting recording off so um but I'm almost done I want to do like one more round maybe and then do the bind off and um I eventually want to do long sleeves on this but Ivy asked for it to be short sleeves and since it's almost spring anyway um I said okay I'll make short sleeves so I'm probably just going to put a cuff on the two sleeves but then I might take the cuff out we'll see how motivated I am because these are sleeves but I want to take the cuff out and do long sleeves in the fall. So, but that kind of will kind of help me to feel like I finished something and I won't have to knit the sleeves. So anyway, if I do get this bound off before I put up the video, I will um, maybe put in a little shot of her modeling this so you can see how it looks, but I'm super happy with how it's turning out. I just love how the colors are fading. I'm holding the yarn triple which I said last time, I have this one main yarn, which is kind of a white base with neon speckles from Hobby Lobby. And then I'm using um, uh, mini skeins, 10 gram minis from my row one yarn. So they're all fingering weight. So I'm holding it triple. And so I'm trying to like fade them gradually. Like I never, I never end two of these at the same point. I always try to do one and then continue the other one for a little while and then stop that one, you know, etc. So, and I'm knitting it on size 10 needles and it's still very, it's very thick. I mean, it's got a good, it's not too stiff, but um, this is at least an Aran weight, maybe a bulky. And, um, and you know what? It was really fun to knit. It was fun to use scraps. It was really fun to keep changing the yarn up all the time. I'm definitely gonna be doing this again uh, because it felt really good. and. This is, I'm using the uh, the flax uh, pattern by Tin Can Knits without the garter stitch, which I feel sorry for Tin Can Knits sometimes. They put this amazing little detail in there and it's always the details that make it a unique pattern that people take out, you know, if they just want a plain thing, but it's a great pattern and I've knit it many, many times. And really, once you get going on your increases and, um, you can, you don't have to think about it. And then once you go on the body, it's just knit, knit, knit. So this was really fun to work on and uh, I'm going to miss it, you know, kind of, but, um, 
I will be really happy to have that done and have her be able to wear that. So I still have quite a few minis left and um, some of them I did end, you know, before I finished like this neon green. I still have about half of that left, which is good because I'm probably, the sleeves are probably going to start kind of in the green area. So that's going to be a little challenging to get all of that reattached, the three different skeins of yarn. And then like, should I make them the same or different? You know, it's just a lot of things to think about, but I think it'll go quickly. But I have, I don't know how much I used exactly. I should have counted how many mini skeins I had when I started. I bet I have like half left, which is good because when I do the long sleeves eventually, that's going to take a surprising amount of yarn. Uh, someone was saying the other day in a podcast that the sleeves are actually like a third of the sweater. And it makes sense. You know, they don't look that big, but they are all the way around. And if you flatten them out, they're like, they're pretty wide. So, um, but hopefully by the next time I record, that will be completely done. That will be an FO, but I've been happy to work on that. Um, the other thing that I have been working really hard on is my everywhere sweater. This is in my bag by, uh, Stolen Minutes, or is it Stolen Minute? I can never remember. Stolen Minutes. I don't know why I always think it's one minute. It's not very much to steal. I was talking last time about how, um, all my projects had finally gotten to a place where, um, I didn't have to think, think, think on every little thing. So that has really helped a lot this last week. But I look how far I have gotten. Last time I had just split for the sleeve. So I was like right here. And I have knit all this, including splitting for the pockets. So there's this like pocket. Um, and really, I suppose I should go like this. So because you you leave some stitches live or do you bind them off no you leave them live and then you cast on new stitches underneath um and then i assume i haven't checked yet but i assume that you um, put these stitches back in the needle and knit the back of the pocket so this is feeling like it's getting close you know how with bulky it kind of hurts your hands and so it's more difficult to uh to just knit for, you know, a long time at a stretch, but I'll just kind of show you. Um, I don't want to put both sides on, but you can see how it fits like this. And stand up a little bit. See, here's the pocket opening right here. And of course, the thing is, the, um, the button band still has to be uh, knit, which will add another inch or two on the center, but I'm really loving how it is going. It's right around to my, it's almost to my hip bone. I would say about a half an inch away from my hip bone. And I don't think it's supposed to be a real long sweater and I don't really want it to be a long sweater. Probably just below my waistband is where I'll stop. So this is coming along. It's kind of, it's kind of like for me, I feel like I want to work on all the projects until I start to sense the end is near <laughs> and then I get a little more monogamous and really focus on those things. Just not a terrible way to be, I guess. But another exciting thing was, you know, I had to rip out because it was too big. I was, I went down a size. I had to rip back to those other numbers and, um, I, finally got to the place where I was knitting new yarn and not the re-balled yarn. That was an exciting moment too. Anyway, so this is coming along and uh, keep working on that. Um, the only other thing that I've worked on is a new start. I, oh, I have been working on my Beauty and the Beast sweater. Last Sunday, I tried it on and uh, I decided to start the ribbing. So, uh, but I have like two rounds of ribbing. <laughs> and it's kind of, uh, you know, I mean, a fingering weight sweater circumference is no joke. And ribbing is like, it takes twice as long because you're putting your yarn back and forth. At least I am. And uh, 
I suppose if you knit continental, you just do it a little, I don't know, maybe it's faster. But I put my yarn back and forth and it takes twice as long to do ribbing. So, um, but I have been working on that and I will continue to work on that because I am so excited to get that sweater done. And then um, I have not really, let's, a confession time. I've not really worked very much on Toby's night sweater. I had started the sleeve around the last podcast time. I was so proud of myself for getting over that hump and then I didn't knit it anymore. <laughs> so I have got to work on that. I think once I'm done with Ivy's sweater, uh, I will make that the new Ivy sweater and work on that um, more specifically. But I do have a new start. Because I cast on Mary's shawl. I am knitting her um, the Rosella shawl by Louisa Harding. It's from her book, Shawls, Wraps, and Scarves. And I'll put a picture in over here. Um, but right now, it is just this really long yellow snake. Which I, which looks like a big circle. It's, it's not knit in the round, but... Um, you cast on a million stitches and then you do short rows to get the kind of very shallow crescent shape. So that's what I'm doing right now. As you can see here, it's getting a little, a little taller. And um, this is in my hand dyed yarn uh, in my Nancy colorway. And um, I'm knitting this in size eight needles and it's a wool and silk blend yarn. And uh, it's going really good. It's kind of nice. It's the short rows are very, uh, they're the same predictable with the part, you know what I mean? And so um, once I kind of got that established, I don't have to think about that. And it's great. It's great church knitting because it's not very big yet. And it's just like a really long knit row. And then I'm doing, you're supposed to do wrap and turn, but since these are just very plain short rows. I'm doing German short rows, which I love, which I highly recommend. And uh, because I hate picking up wraps, I'm just no good at it. And I'm never sure how to do it. So, um, so this has become my church knitting and my sort of uh, completely brain dead end of the night knitting. This is in my bag by uh, Delightful Works by Susan. And I love this bag. I don't know if I ever showed you the back. It's got like um, like a knitting print on the back, which is so cute. And the thing I love about this bag, besides that it's, it's so cute and it's very sturdy. It's, it's lined with something, probably, um, quilt batting of some sort, I would say. Um, it's something crinkly in here. Anyway, um, what I really love about this is that the front is a, like a, um, a log cabin quilt block. So, all of them are different, and I just really love this one. I loved this fabric here, the brown with the flowers. It's just so cute. So I am enjoying that immensely. So that's really all the knitting I've done. Except, like I said, I did do a little more on the Beauty and the Beast, but I'm not going to show you because it would be very boring. So moving on to, I have some cross stitch that I want to show you. One of them is actually a new uh, project that I just started. And the other thing is just like, I'm gathering supplies for it, but I just wanted to show you. Uh, my friend and I went to a used craft store, supply store. It was really interesting. It's called the Craft Box. It's in... Uh, well, it's in Denver. And um, they they had all kinds of stuff. I mean, they had needlepoint, cross-stitch, uh, fabric, uh, you know, um, what's it called? Scrapbooking, paper, crafting kind of supplies. Um, they had knitting stuff and yarn. But it's all the kind of stuff like... Uh, you know, grandma's cleaning out her craft room or you're cleaning out grandma's craft room, you know, or, you know, you, you decide I'm never going to use this and you want to sell it. And so, um, 
but they have really they had really good prices. I was I was really happy about that because uh, some of the stuff was really nice and it was none of it was like ridiculously priced. So I got this kit. I wonder what year this is from. 1995. I got this kit. It's a dimensions cross stitch kit. And it's called uh, Winter Wonderland, designed by Carl Valenti. Hmm. But anyway, it's this beautiful winter scene with a house and a sleigh. And I am going to cross stitch this for my mom for Christmas. Now, my mom, I don't who I don't think watches this. Hi, mom. If you're watching this, this is your Christmas present. <laughs> um. Uh. She, I've knit her some things in the past. She never wears them. So, and I think she feels bad about it. <laughs> but if I cross stitch something for her, she puts it up and loves it. So, uh, I, I made for her a few years ago, another cross stitch that was like a house. She loves houses. So, and I do too. Um, so I thought this was perfect and I just, I'm going to enjoy working on it. So I just started it. It came with all the threads and everything and a needle, which is good because I never have cross stitch needles. So I got all the threads out and separated them. They came with this nice little card. I love doing this. I love kitting things up. That's part of the, the fun. And then it's just some uh, 14 count Ada, I think it comes with. And you know what? I'll be honest. I've, I've cross stitched on Ada and on linen. And I kind of prefer Ada. I know it looks really nice on linen and it looks more like old fashioned and more, I don't know, like pops out a little bit more, but it's just fine that for me because I, maybe because I don't do it all the time. It's just much, much slower. So this is just Ada and I just started, I have some little trees because, um, I, I was starting like, I'm a very old school cross stitcher because I learned to cross stitch like in my teenage years. And so that was like the late nineties, right? And uh, so I always start in the middle. So it's like these little trees right here by the house. And I'm just trying to do a little bit every week, every, I didn't work on it yesterday, but every few days, I'm just trying to do um, a little bit because cross stitch is very slow. Christmas is far away, but I know how these things go. And I don't want to have, you know, 50 hours of cross stitching to do right before Christmas. That would just be, I just wouldn't finish it. You know, I just wouldn't finish it. So I'm going to work on that for my mom. And the other thing, I'm just making myself a little kit because I bought a cross stitch pattern from Instagram. Well, not from Instagram, but which I saw on Instagram. Thank you, Instagram. Um, it's by Al Forest Embroidery and it is called Forest Houses Mole, I think. It's the Mole's Forest House. So this is going to be a series. Uh, she's already done two. And the first one was, oh, what was it? A beaver? I think it was a beaver. And it was really cute. He had a little wood cutting shop. But the second one was a mole. And he was sitting in his little underground house, reading a book, with a bookcase and a fire and their little mice all around and things growing under the ground. It's a cutaway, you know? And then up above, it's all snowy and there's a cardinal sitting on a tree stump and and snow. <sighs> so, even though I told myself, Holly, what are you doing? You have so much knitting to do. So much knitting that you have to do because you told other people you would do it. <laughs> so many, so much knitting that you want to do because you told yourself you wanted to do it. This other cross stitch kit, well, actually, I think I bought them all in first. So anyway, but you know what? Cross stitch for me is a spring thing. Cross stitch is a like, oh, it's not cold anymore. It's time to cross stitch. It doesn't last very long sometimes. So we'll see. But what I did was, first of all, I, I found a piece of fabric because the picture, which I will have shown you, um, is on kind of a like a uh, pumpkin-y tan looking fabric. So I found this Ada, it was ancient, so I washed it and I need to iron it. And um, one of my friends gave me a bunch of cross stitch stuff they bought in the garage sale. And I thought this would be perfect and I counted the squares to make sure it was big enough and it is. 
And then at the craft box, because the, the kit is with hand dyed uh, flosses, I saw that they had some hand dyed flosses. So I just picked out a few colors and I think I'm gonna go back and try to finish and get the rest of the colors because um, these cost about half of what they do online. So this is kind of a uh, crescent colors, hand dyed floss. I got several of those. Gray sticks, which is like a tonal brown. Lunar eclipse, which is a pale gray. Uh, desert mesquite, which is like a green. And then I got a gentle art current, which is a beautiful red burgundy. And the gentle art uh, chalk, which is a tonal white. So I thought that'd be for the snow. So I think I'm gonna try, there's only 12 colors. I think I'm gonna try to go back and see if I can find um, approximations for the rest of the colors because uh, I, I often change colors in uh, cross stitch if I don't have the kit, so. And I really wanted to buy the kit, but it was coming from the UK, because you can buy the kit on Etsy. It was coming from the UK, it said, and it was, the shipping was almost as much as the kit, so I just like, that's it. So I'm not gonna start that until I get the rest of the floss and <sighs> need something new. Uh, I highly recommend that you check out Owl Forest Embroidery. Uh, I love a lot, a lot, a lot of their designs. I don't know. I think they have different designers, but I think they're based in Russia, which is really interesting. And um, so, but they have really, I just love their stuff. A lot of it is very um, whimsical and sort of storybookish. They have a... Um, they have a Wizard of Oz uh, chart that I got for free somehow. At, maybe it's still free, I don't know, but it was uh, beautiful. And of course, I don't know when I'm gonna make it, but uh, anyway, so I, I recommend you check her out. Okay, it's time for book talk. I have a lot to talk to you about book talk today because at the craft box, I bought some vintage knitting pattern uh, magazines. So I wanted to show you. So first of all, I got this and this was actually on sale. That's why it's highlighted. So this was 25 cents. Uh, but this just cracked me up. Around the world sweaters. And it says, today everyone wears sweaters everywhere. Here for you to knit are 20 of the newest, most distinctive designs and textures from almost every country. <laughs> that just cracks me up. There's, there's a slightly more than 20 countries in the world. But anyway, this is full of beautiful, um, beautiful sweaters, Peruvian pullover, uh, Canadian outdoor sweater. This is like the classic 1950s, uh, uh, like relaxing sweater. Um, I really like some of these. You can see here the uh, Coco Chanel um, influence in these boxy ladies sweaters which I think is a really nice look actually. Um, they have some beautiful color work, stripes, a classic Norwegian sweater, which I've never done one of those. Um, I think this is very interesting, this sort of jackety look. I love the color work. Here's a classic Aaron. I mean, so you can see, I mean, 25 cents, 25 cents for this sweater. An Icelandic pullover. This one was really interesting because it's actually like embroidered. It's not just, um, it's not just color work. I think it's kind of like cross stitched on. And this Italian pullover I actually thought was really nice with the stripes. It's a, uh, I don't know if it's fisherman's rib, but it has that chunky rib look. So 25 cents. Um, then I got these two Women's Day knitting books. They were together. I don't remember how much I paid for these, but it wasn't very much. And um, I just thought this was a really exciting look. This is from, what year is this? Um, it was really hard to see the year. Let me look over here. 1972, this first one is 1972. 
And um, it's interesting, some of the trends that are coming back, like look at this one, is an embroidered sweater. And that is really big right now. I don't, I don't know if a lot of people are doing it, but a lot of designers are doing it because I think it's kind of difficult and tricky. But there are just some beautiful, look at these blazers. Wow. And these are mostly ladies patterns. Some of them are really classic. I mean, look at this. You could knit that today. Oh, here's a couple men's sweaters. Always on the lookout for good men's sweaters. This is a really pretty sweater. It's actually like a lacy. Mary, you need to be quiet. Mary. This is actually like a lacy cardigan. Oh, look at the little girl. So there's, you know, don't discount things because they're old, because old things can be wonderful. And they people get tired of them and they move on. And that doesn't mean that those things don't have value anymore. Let's see what year this is from. This has a cool knitted or a crocheted skirt or something. It might be knitted. 1969, this one's a little earlier. They have some how to knit info at the beginning. And this is from Women's Day also. Some really interesting knitted and crocheted designs in here. It's amazing what a difference color photographs do. So it's just kind of hard to tell sometimes what things look like in black and white. This is really cool. This is really pretty. Classic, look at this. Granny square skirt, totally do that. Really should, should just do it. This is really pretty. I love these kind of like lace sweaters. I just love lace sweaters. I wish they didn't take so long to knit. This is really nice. I have a more modern day pattern that looks very similar to that. Oh, there's some kids. It looks kind of like a houndstooth or gingham or something. That's cute. Kids um, patterns, I think, are so timeless. Look at this for the whole family. Aww. Ah, some men's sweaters. I'm so glad that they're including men's sweaters. That's not very, uh, that's not so super common. Classic hats and balaclavas. Ooh, a helmet. Now see, this might be good. Toby wanted a hood for his uh, night sweater, and I think he wants it to look like the night helmet, you know. So I might be able to pull this, especially if it's worsted. I might be able to pull this pattern. That's one of the good things about getting these old pattern things, too, is that you never know. If, if you do a lot of um, pattern mashup things, which I do sometimes, then it's really a good uh, resource to have. Uh, then I got this one, which I was super excited to see because this is knits for men's and men's <laughs> knits for men and boys, and um, and this is from a great year to 1965. Oh, I was so excited to see this. Um, so uh, look at this. Look at these men. So good. I love this guy's vest. I need to knit my men some vests like that. If you are a fan of the old show, Get Smart, he wears in that show a really cool um, button-up bright red vest, and I just love that. So, and some of these, some of these pictures are really fuzzy. This is a really nice garter stitch. It looks pretty chunky. Garter stitch cardigan. That looks like it would be pretty easy. Uh, like a honeycomb cable, some color work. Look, it even has this old postcard still in it. Um, these are supposed to be tweed yarns, and I don't know why. It's really hard to tell because they're in black and white. These look like very rag kind of yarns. They must have been knitted in. I really wonder how soft these yarns were 
because um, it always seems like when you touch uh, an old sweater, they're real scratchy. This is really nice looking. Classic cable cardigan. This was interesting to me. It says that they um, they brushed it. It was a, let's see, soft rust colored sweater in a yarn bulked with mohair. A steel brush used on it gives a handsome curried look. So you know how sometimes you see those really, oh, what is it called? Like I used to see them in the 90s in catalogs, a boiled wool blazer. And uh, I never bought one, but I thought they were cool. But um, they look very like felted almost. And I think that's what they did here, but they brushed it. They took their knitting and they brushed it with a steel brush to mess up the yarn. It kind of was like, oh, I don't know if I could do that anyway. But it does look nice. Uh, this is a really nice cable. I don't know about this. I wonder how this guy feels about this sweater. Maybe it was very cool. It looks like he's wearing a... Uh, like a weird, like, Lord Mayor kind of necklace. These are just very nice classic men's sweaters. And then they have a whole bunch of accessories, and they just drew the accessories. I wonder if they just didn't knit them. But these slipper socks look really cool. I just wonder if you could find or somehow make the, the moccasin bottom. But I think my husband would wear those really long socks. There's golf cover things, and these are like golf sweaters. It's hilarious. So many cool things. These are very handsome and manly. More errands and a Gainsey. So I always wonder how many, how many people knitted these and wore these. Now I was very excited about these two. These are uh, kids' patterns, mostly, I think entirely. So this one, raglans, this is all raglans. So it's all different kinds of raglans. And um, this is from, let's see if I can find the year. Oh, it's, it's in uh, Roman numerals, hold on. <laughs> it's in 1964, 1964. So once again, we have some great like school type sweaters. Uh, these look like those mohair sweaters everyone loved back in those days, very fancy. I love this coat, I think that's really nice. It has a great texture. Um, this is so cute, it's so colorful. I have to knit that for a little boy who would not mind. But look at this, they have this huge turtleneck that you can make into a cowl if it's cold. I just love these retro styles. Some really nice little like dress sweaters. Some kind of plain school uniform kind of knits. These are very cute. Look at this one. Coco Chanel again. Gloves. These are really nice. I love the variety they were able to get and still, they're still just using raglan shaping. I just think that's amazing. Um, but there are a lot, a lot, a lot of good ones in here. So that was raglans. I'm sure I'm gonna knit a few of these for my kids. And then this one, this is even earlier, I think. Uh, why is it so hard to find the year? Because this looks like it's either the early 60s or um, late 50s. Well, anyway, I don't, I don't know if I can find the year in this. I think it's the 50s. It just has that look to me. There should be some, some uh, publishing information somewhere. But I was really excited. I told um, Ivy and Mary to look through these when uh, when I got them to see if there's anything that stood out to them. So Mary likes this one. She likes the little collar and the short sleeves and that's probably like a fingering weight sweater. I'm not sure though, but that is very cute. So I will have to put that on the list for her. And then one of the ones that I really liked was this. 
And Ivy, as she was looking through, she was like, oh, she actually gasped and she wanted me to knit this. And so I was like, yes, because of course, there's nothing like knitting something that you wanted to knit and you were hoping somebody would want to wear it. So um, I took a look at this pattern. It's really interesting because it's plaid on the front and it's all like you don't do anything later, no duplicate stitch or anything. Um, so it's either color work or intarsia. And the back is plain. So the back, you knit a ribbed back, a ribbed cuff, you knit the back plain, and then you knit the front separately with the color work. There's no ribbing on the bottom of this. It's just, it starts immediately. It might, there might be a hem. I think there's a hem. And then you start the color work. And so I thought that was really interesting because it's kind of like those, uh, the old waistcoat pattern vest on the front, plain silk back. Uh, I just thought that was really interesting. So I probably, I guess I will make it the way it says. I think that would be interesting to see. I like this color work here. Oh, I really like this one. I think this is so classic. I love the, I love how it's like a V. And I know these are children's patterns, but uh, depending on the yarn that they used and what the weight of it is, I may be able to size it um, up or down and knit something for me or David or, you know, if it's just some kid sizes for, for Grady. I love this. I always wanted, I didn't always want, I did not get a letter jacket when I was in high school and I should have. Uh, but this has that sort of varsity, I love the stripes on one arm look to it. So I really like that one. Some nice boys. Look, they did this a few times, I noticed. The bottom hem of the sweater is flipped up. Why? Is it because it's too long? And they're like trying to show you, look, you can grow into it. I just think that's weird. Um, stadium styles. Skating. Is that it? I think that's it. So... Uh, I was really happy with my little vintage knitting pattern haul because I think I'm definitely going to be using it. And I think that's very exciting. And uh, it was, you know, just a few dollars, which is always really fun. Okay. Uh, now for regular book talk. <laughs> I have my Anne of Green Gables, which I started. Now I started reading this and I was like, wow, this story is progressing really quickly. And I realized this is the junior classics for young readers. It's been abridged. And I was like, no, I hate reading abridged books. So I went to, recently, I went to my used bookstore that I like, Second and Charles. And I got the original unabridged. And I've started reading it. I am, I'm in chapter three. And, oh, it's so nice. It's it's really interesting to, to compare because, like I said, I never read abridged books. So they took out all of Anne's long speeches and they took out all of the descriptions of the countryside and of the people so that, of course, the story goes much quicker, but it's kind of like all the beautiful parts are taken out. So I'm really, really enjoying this. And I, I am either a really slow reader because I don't have a lot of time or I'm like a super speedy reader and I just plow through things. So I hope that I will uh, not be a slow reader on this. We will see. When I was at that bookstore, I bought a few more Anna Green Gables books and I couldn't find all of them, which was really annoying because and part of it's my fault because I don't put things away. And part of it's because I live with six other people and they're always moving things. So. Um, but at least I got these. I got um, Anne's House of Dreams, which is number four, five. Uh, Anne of Ingleside, which is number six. And Rilla of Ingleside, which is number eight. So, and I already got, last time when I was at the thrift store, I got number four, which was the um, uh, Anne of Windy Poplars. So, and I think I got Anne of the Island, and that's the thing. I know I got more than this. I think I got Anne of the Island, and I can't find it. It's, I'm super annoyed. But I do not have, I know I don't have number two, Anne of Avonlea, so I need to look for that one. They didn't have it. 
I'm sorry, I keep sniffing. In one of the comments on my last episode, um, Sharon, hi Sharon, uh, asked me if I ever read The Wheel on the School because she liked that author, which is mm, uh, Mindert de Jong. I think he's Dutch. I'm not sure. But I, and I told her, yes, I love The Wheel on the School. It, it was one of the books that I used to read. Um, I used to read sort of a set of kids books to myself over and over again in my 20s before I had kids. Um, Teddy was born when I was 25, I think. And, uh, and I got married when I was 19. So even though I was a grown up, I loved to reread these books from my childhood. And I, I just read them over and over again. I read Charlotte's Web. I read The Secret Garden and A Little Princess. Um, and I read, oh, I, there, there's probably a lot more than that. Um, some of the Wizard of Oz, Wizard of Oz books. So there were, there were, there were probably 10 or 15 books that I read almost every year. I would just kind of feel like, I think it's just comfort, a comfort read. So, so I told her yes, but I had never read anything else by that author. And as I have gotten older, I have <clears throat> really started to appreciate finding an author that I love and reading everything that they wrote from the beginning, like in order, if possible, but at least reading everything they that they wrote. So when I was at, um... Second and Charles, I looked, you know, I looked under his last name and they had these two books by him, The House of Sixty Fathers, which is a Newbery honor book. And it's about a little boy in China, I think. And it looks really exciting. <clears throat> and this one called Shadrach. And so I, uh, I'm very, very excited to read these two books. They just, and then this is a Newbery, is this Newbery Honor also? This is also a Newbery Honor book. So, and I didn't even, you know, I, I try not to read the back of books because I just feel like they spoil too much. So I usually just read, and I didn't even read the beginning because I knew Sharon recommended them. I was going to love them because I like this author and they're old. When are these books published? Uh, 1953. Probably most of my books that I love are mid-century, uh, mid-20th century books. So I'm really excited to read these and I'll probably eventually read them to my kids. Um, while I was over there in the D's, I happened to look up and they had all the Roald Dahl books. So I got these. These are his sort of autobiography. I mean, he says it's not an autobiography, but this is memories from his childhood. And this is sort of like the rest of the story. And so, ah, I'm so excited to read this. I actually have started reading this one. I am about almost halfway through. And uh, it's really, really fascinating, his childhood, because of course he was, he grew up in uh, England. Well, in Wales. He might have been born in Wales. I'm not sure. He was from Norway. Yeah, he was from Norway. And um, so he talks about going back home to see his grandparents and stuff in Norway. And he had a really horrific experience with a woman who owned a candy shop. So I think that's interesting that he wrote Charlie and the Chocolate Factory later. I wonder if he's going to talk about that. Anyway, so I'm really excited about those. Over in the adult books, I always check to see if they have any misread books because I'm just collecting those. There's a whole bunch of them. And I found this one, which was great because this is her first book, Thrush Green. And I had to think very carefully to, to if I had this one already, but I didn't. So I'm glad I got it. So anyway, if you've never heard of Miss Reed, I think I've talked about her before. She's just a school teacher in rural uh, England. And um, she just talks about village life and school and the people. And they're so relaxing and just nice to read. So I'm really excited to read this. 
I also got this. I'm very slowly because this is only the second one I've gotten. Collecting these um, Bryant and May Peculiar Crimes Unit books by Christopher Fowler. Christopher Fowler and this this series specifically. It's one of the very, very few modern writers that I read because I just think uh, he is really interesting and I always learn something. And that's one of the things I love about reading old books is that I feel like um, some pieces of the puzzle fall into place about the world and the history and the way things are and the way they used to be. And he always does something about, he always has kind of a theme. So this is called The Victoria Vanishes. So I think this is about, I think it's Victoria Station and the Underground. Um, anyway, these, these are always, I think, serial killer type books and they're not really cozy mysteries, but they're not like gory or anything. But anyway, so I'm very, I'm just collecting these because I read all these from the library and I saw this one and I was excited. Also, I love these covers. I just love the covers. So that was my book haul and I did get a couple more, but like I said, I can't find them. Super annoyed about it. They'll turn up. I got one more book at the um, Second and Charles that I'm really excited about and I actually... I have already read the whole thing. I went to Second and Charles a week ago today and I got this book and I started reading it when I got home and I finished it Tuesday. So uh, in just a few days. So I'm going to show you. This is the biography of Mr. Rogers. It was so good. It was really, really good. Um, You guys, I'm sure, know who Mr. Rogers is, <laughs> but in case you don't, he had um, a TV show on PBS. Well, it was on PBS when I was a kid in the 80s and 90s, and it went off the air in 2001, I think, and he passed away in 2003, and um, but he actually was on TV since the, I think, the 50s, So, but it was like a local show, and then he had a, a more national show. But um, anyway, I have so many fond memories of watching his show in the 80s and probably the 90s too. And um, I mean, who doesn't? <laughs> who did not see this show? It was just, but it was so interesting in this book because he talks about how um, the author, uh, Maxwell King, talks about how he was so concerned about children and what they were seeing and how they were able to uh, process things emotionally and he he did not like tv like he didn't watch tv <clears throat> so he broke a lot of rules well for one thing because he started when tv was in its infancy and then he just continued on in that vein and he was very concerned about childhood development and about um violence on tv and about you know, he didn't want, he, he didn't really want children to just, uh, have a bunch of facts crammed into their heads and for them not to be able to, or, or to be ignored in their emotional and social well-being. I don't know how to explain it, but, but he was one of those, he was one of those people who really cared about people and specifically about children. And so it was, it was interesting because it talked about his childhood and sort of what they think contributed to his interest in children and his desire to help them and um, to dedicate his life to them, really. And it, it was just really interesting. So I read this whole book and then I knew that there was, I knew that there was a Mr. Rogers knitting book that had been recently published floating out around there somewhere in the, in the world. And so I, when I, when I read this book and I loved it so much, I was like, I'm just going to have to get that book. <laughs> so I did. I ordered Knitting in the Neighborhood and I'm going to do a flip through with you. I'm so glad I got it because it looks like an amazing book. This book is an official knitting pattern book, which I thought was really neat because in the inside, it says copyright 2022 fred rogers company 
So I am really excited about this. There's there's really a lot of good uh, patterns in here. They have sweaters, puppets, accessories, toys, and blankets. And um, I'm especially excited about the sweaters. I think they did a great job. Um, you know, his mom, he said in the book, in the biography, his mom knit him a book, every, uh, knit him a book. His mom knit him a sweater every year until she died. And I just think that's very sweet. Um, so they did a beautiful job on the sweaters and they're all zippers, I think. And they give you directions for changing it to buttons if you want to change it to buttons. But you know what? If you're going to knit a Mr. Rogers sweater, put a zipper in it. Try to do it. I love this one, of course, because it's red. I don't know if I just love it because it's red. <laughs> and I also know that I'm knitting a red cardigan right now. Do I need another red cardigan? I probably do. So I might knit this one eventually. This is just a very plain uh, zippered cardigan. I love the collar. The collar is very retro looking to me. Retro menswear, which I think is really cool. Um, there's also this one, which is got has got little um, some ribbed sleeves. They did a great job, like copying the colors and everything. I think they're beautiful. This one has like a texture pattern across the the front and a black area around the zipper. Very nice. Um, this one, I love his original color. They didn't, it's not quite as minty in theirs, but it's got this beautiful cable going up and on the sleeve, it's got a beautiful cable. I really like that one too. Uh, this one is so cool. It's like, um, it's mohair yarn held double. Most of the other ones I think are in worsted weight, which is really nice. And this is mohair held double to a worsted gauge, kind of. And um, that's actually the sweater he's wearing on the front of this book. And uh, you can see it's kind of a little more open. And it's just really nice. <clears throat> and it's just got cables on the front, which I think is cool. And that's that one. Here's a more front picture of it. And then they made a little one for kids. And guess what? Grady loves Mr. Rogers. He calls him Mr. Rogers. <laughs> it's so cute. And it's so cool to watch him because Grady is not yet two. And he will just sit there and watch him. And um, it's just amazing. It's just amazing. And uh, one of the things that they said in this other book is that... Um, uh, compared to other shows which are more frantic or frenetic, I can't know, frantic, I don't know, which are more fast paced, kids who watch Mr. Rogers like stay calm and focused. Uh oh, my light just went away. And uh, I can I can attest to that. It's very true. Grady just sits and watches and he focuses so hard. And when Mr. Rogers says like. He says things to him at the at the uh, at the beginning and end of the show. He like really listens and like talks back to him. It's so cute. Anyway, because of course we had to watch some Mister Rogers and I was doing all this, and so I looked on Amazon. There's one season available on Amazon, and then you have to get a subscription to PBS Kids to watch the rest. Although I think you can buy some DVDs. So I told David I'd like to see if we can get some of the seasons from the '80s. Um, which I would probably remember. So anyway, they have a kid's version. Then they have this baby version, which is adorable, which is the one with the, uh, the ridges on the sleeves. And then they have, um, a baby onesie version. Look at this with pants. So adorable. I wonder what sizes are. It goes up to 24 months. I don't know. Uh, if Grady would do that, but it's so cute. Then they have puppets. Now, I th think they did a great job on the puppets. Now, of course, the king and the queen in the show, they have these big plastic faces. So they don't look quite as um, similar to the original, but I think the owl and Daniel Tiger look very similar to the original puppets. 
And um, cause here, here's a Daniel Tiger and here's their Daniel Tiger. He is so cute. And here's King Friday. See, here's the original. He's got like this big plastic serious face. But I think they did a, a beautiful job on his cape, doing those little tassels and things. The details, I think, are excellent. And then we have Queen Sarah Saturday. She has a beautiful sparkly dress. And they put all these little um, quotes in the book too. The X the Owl Puppet which is so cute. He lives in the, I guess it's just a tree. They did a great job on him. And then the accessories, they have some really interesting things in here. First of all, this there's this scarf that is supposed to be reminiscent of his curtains, which is really cute. I, I really like that, um, all those little triangles. I think those are pretty. I wonder how difficult that would be to knit. Then there's these shoes, so cute. Um, the reason he put on tennis shoes at the beginning of all his shows was because uh, he had to wear tennis shoes in the 1950s show or because he clomped <laughs> across the stage, he had to run because it was live. And uh, if he didn't wear shoes, it was really, like tennis shoes, it was really loud. So that's why he always changed into tennis shoes on the show. They have this amazing, like super 70s striped necktie, look at this. And I really like this because uh, they, it's like a diagonal and then they fold it up and sew it. And so it's really nice on the edges because that's one thing about knitting garter stitch. Sometimes your edges get kind of uh, wibbly wobbly. They have a Mr. McFeely's speedy delivery hat. So cute. And then they have these toys. I love the Mr. Rogers. I think he's adorable. The trolley. Um, a fish and a food shaker. So some little goldfish and a food shaker to, to feed them. The little mini Mr. Rogers. And I love it that they put Daniel Tiger on his hand. I think that's very sweet. They did a good job on that. He's a very detailed pattern and he's got his real shoes and his little tennis shoes. Then they have the stoplight. They said, um, it says here, during the opening sequence of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, the stoplight in the living room was always yellow. It was a reminder to viewers to slow down, perhaps even just a little. I think that's very sweet. Then they have these little mini sweaters, mini cardigans. So cute. Then they have blankets. So they have these blankets that have words on them. Won't you be my neighbor? Question mark. It's very sweet. I like you just the way you are. He used to say that at the end of every show. And this last one, the neighborhood trolley baby blanket. So it has like out in the in the town and going and then in the world of make-believe with the castle. So, and I think that's all. Um, so I, I can see myself making several of these patterns, probably some of the sweaters, um, I'll probably have to make Grady a little Mr. Rogers sweater. Um, I might even make one of the blankets. I might make the Daniel Tiger. So I highly recommend you check this out if you can. Okay, the only thing I have left is some shop news. So um, I am going to have a shop update Saturday, March 25th at 11 a.m. Eastern. I guess it's Eastern Daylight Savings Time now because we're in Daylight Savings Time. Does anyone else hate day Daylight Savings Time? Because I do. I wish we could just stay in the regular time. I'm a mess for like a week after Daylight Savings Time. <laughs> Shop update, Saturday, March 25th, 11 a.m. Eastern. Uh, the main thing that I'm going to have in my shop update, and I hope to have some other things, which will be a surprise, but the main thing I'm going to have is a mini skein set that is going to be my Easter uh, thing. So let me show that to you. This is called The Good Shepherd. And um, 
So it has um, a fleecy white, which has a little gray in it, um, a dark brown, uh, grass green, sky blue, and a red. So this is my Easter colorway for 2023. And you know what? I was thinking, oh, I need to design <laughs> some mitts that start out with like, I don't know, maybe I would start with the brown and do some color work and then have a, like a pastoral scene with the green grass and the little sheep dotting it with their dark faces and the sky. And I think I would do hearts for the red. So I'm basing this off of the verse that says, um, where Jesus said, I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. So that is my inspiration for this. This is my Easter, Easter colorway. I'm super proud of it. I'm really excited. I love, 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 love how some of these colors turned out. The green is just beautifully tonal. Let me, let me grab another one. There's just lots of colors in here. And I used, I used quite a few different dyes in this green and I just love how it turned out. And um, the blue is also really, um, really variegated and uh, would look like a beautiful sky, I think with fleecy clouds in it. Um, the brown has some great highlights in it a lot of uh, light places and I wanted to do this brown for like the sheep faces but also if you wanted to think of it as being the cross for Easter I think that would be beautiful and then of course I did red for sacrifice and I just think um, you know not a lot of dyers do a lot of red and I love red and so I just I, I feel like I do it a lot but I I feel like it's special and um, I really wanted to do a red for sacrifice and Jesus's blood and for um, just love, just the love that he showed us. So that is my Easter inspiration and I hope you'll check out the update. I'm hoping to have some other springy uh, things in the shop, but um, I will see you then. As far as life update is concerned, I was able to read that whole book because Mary stayed home from co-op on Tuesday because she was sick and so I stayed with her and so I had a lot of reading time. Um, otherwise, everyone's been healthy, which is a blessing. We're, we're coming up on birthday season here, so I am really trying to think about uh, birthday presents to make people and also, I suppose I should buy some presents. It's definitely getting springier here in our chickens. We have we have eight chickens. We have one Rhode Island Red, whose name is Lucy. And we have seven Wyandotte chickens, which are like black and white, speckly. And it's interesting because we got them all together, but three of the Wyandots look different than the other Wyandots, and they're all Wyandots. And we looked them up and it's just a different, um, I don't know if it's a different breed of Wyandotte or if it's just a different like way they turn out. But anyway, uh, they, um, the Wyandots had not started laying eggs yet. So evidently Rhode Island Reds are big producers. They, they start earlier laying eggs. We got our, our chickens in the fall. And so it was kind of like, they're just now starting to get old enough they're just now starting to get old enough to lay eggs. Well, finally, just yesterday, I think, or the day before, we were starting to get some starter eggs from our wine dots. So we're super excited about that because we're, we're really looking forward to the day when we can get eight eggs a day. That'll be really nice. And we'll eat them, trust me. But it'd be nice to have some to give to our family and friends too, so. Anyway, I think that's all I have for you today. So thank you so much for joining me. I will see you again soon. Happy knitting. Bye.